ייתן לו כבוד, וליועץ אתה. וליועץ אתה, אל גיבור אתה, אביעד אתה, שא שלום אתה, ואיך כך נקרא, הכל לשון תודה, שרק שלך בזמן, מושיע ויועץ. וליועץ אתה, אל גיבור אתה, אביעד אתה, שלום אתה, עוברת לך תקרא, כל לשון תודה, שעכשיו קבל זמן, שיהיה ופועל לישוע, תבוא מלכותך, יעשה עצמך, הללויה ישוע.
תגדל בקהילה שלנו, אדון, בשכונות שלנו, בעיר הזה, בעיר באר שבע, אדון. תן לנו כוח, תן לנו, תן לנו הרוח החודש, אדון, תן לנו הרוח שלך לרומם אותך בעיר הזה, אדון. מסתכלים עליך, אדון, אנחנו לא יכולים לעשות כלום לבד, אבל ברוח שלך, אדון, ברוח שלך אנחנו יכולים, אנחנו יותר ממנצחים, אדון. הללויה. כמה אנחנו צריכים אותך, אדון.
ישועה. בעמיתנו אל ישועה, מכונן האמונה. אומה שלמה, שבעל השמחה סבל את הצלב ובת ביטו אליו לכל החלום שלכם. הביטו אליו בשביל המשפחה שלכם, בשביל המשפחה שלנו, הביטו אליו. כל מה שכואב בפנים, הביטו אליו. כל המחלות שסובלים, הביטו אליו. כל הסובלים, כל, ה... כל הדברים ש... שאתה ב... בבית כלא מזה, הביטו אליו, הביטו אל הישוע. כי בו יש תקווה, בו יש שלום, בו יש תשובה. הללויה.
מי שיצא אומר, אצה כפן, הסלע, הביטחון שלי, הלחם והיין, הדרך האמת והחיים רק בך, לא חסר לי דבר.
Shabbat Shalom again. We heard a lot today, but I would want to speak about something that God put on my heart. First of all, I'm really happy to see Siegfried and his wife here with us. I think that the topic of Israel in these times are, is very important. And I think all around believers in the world, it's a, uh, it's a set point that you can see God's spirit in them. Uh, that's what I think. Loving Israel is something unnatural. It's not, it's not a logical thing. It's because of God's choice and because of God's spirit working in people. And it's not because the people of Israel is better than anyone else or wiser. It's because God chose. And whoever has God's spirit has this love. So we thank you for standing with us and I pray that God will continue to be with you. I want to give some, in, uh, some of an introduction before. Like we spoke about it before, we live in a world which is totally different from God's kingdom. When God created the world, He created it perfectly, as we know. Adam and Eve had a, a purpose, a job, and after falling to sin, things started going down more and more. And we live in a very, uh, very hard time or many things that God says about them that they're good are considered to be bad and what God considers evil are, is considered to be good. It's a very extreme time. We need to choose to believe what God says. We have to ha take this active work in our lives to deny the lie that we live in and to receive the correct thinking of what God tells us. So let's open in Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. It connects also to what Eduardo says, said. That one of the first things in the weekly portion 
uh, that Eduardo spoke about is about the Hebrew slave. After six years, he goes out free, but he, he can choose to stay. He has the choice. He has the choice. Do I want to continue with my Lord or do I want to go out free? So I think that each and every one of us, God does not force us. He doesn't come to put something on us that if we don't want to take it, we have to. No, we don't have to. But our process of being becoming holier <coughs> is to choose to stay and to choose to receive what God says for our lives. And that same servant or the same slave that chooses to stay, Exodus 21 tells us that uh, his Lord takes his ear and nails it to the door post. And I thought to myself, why specifically the ear? And the ear is the organ that we use to hear. So we don't only listen and let it flow out from the other side. No, it means what do we uh, what do I listen to? Not only hearing, but also listening. The ear is the, one, is the organ through which I can receive things that I want to keep in my heart. So when we open the word of God, we need to open our ears and receive it into our heart. Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Paul the Apostle in the Epistle of Romans speaks about many topics about the plan of salvation of God and about the law, the law of death, Moses' law, and the law of life, and about people walking in the flesh and walking in the spirit, and in the purpose of the people of Israel, and that God did not leave them, and that He has a plan, and about the salvation of the Gentiles and about many other things that he speaks about in Romans, and he comes to the bottom line. <coughs> so 11 chapters, he, he was explaining things that are maybe sometimes hard to understand, but here he comes to this bottom line, the conclusion, what, should, what it should cause us to do. First of all, it's some sort of... A, an alert for us. We need to give our bodies to God. It's some sort of a warning. And we don't have to do it because God forces us. No. It's not like a task list that if you gave your bodies to God, that's it. You can continue forward. No, it's because we submit to God. Everyone who loves God, everyone who knows His presence and knows Yeshua, knows that he needs to submit to Yeshua's word. And Paul the Apostle comes and warns us here to take our bodies and to not only our bodies, but also in verse 2, he says uh, to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. A new mind. We need <coughs> to take God's principles and to change then change the lies of the devil with God's principles. This is the recipe to be renewed, to be transformed. We all want a change in our lives, right? Is there anyone who is 100% happy with what he has now? I don't think so, but there is a recipe here. You want to, do you want to be changed, changed with something? Take God's correct principle and learn it and receive it and speak it and you will see a change be transformed by the renewing of your mind when we take God's principle we can be changed as long as 
we do not change our way of thinking and through through that the way of our life it's lost it's just a list of commandments that we will never reach we need to choose to be changed with this thing so this is the introduction to all this topic of lies of the world and our need to change them with God's word and God's truth. And I wanted to share with you one of the principles that's important connected to the family and especially to the times that we live in now. And I'll say it through something that happened to me. I wanted to watch a video on YouTube about some something that for my work and what ad jumped up. <laughs> How can you make money without going out to work? Do you know it? Have you seen these ads <laughs> before? You'll be, you won't need to work any, uh, like uh, money will hold, fall down from heaven and you'll be happy. And that's one of the uh, lies that are dream that that's a dream of everyone here you can make so much money and you won't need to do anything that's the ideal dream something that uh, will bring money into your bank account and you'll <laughs> sit down and drink a banana shake and you won't need to take care of anything else for the rest of your life right that's that's like a lie that's going deep and deeper and we see many young people uh, going, following people who uh, made lots of money and found this formula that you don't do anything and you receive tons of money and it might be true that there are ways to do that it might be true that there is a formula. I don't deny it totally. It might be that there are wise people who manage to figure out how to make money in such a way or another. The question is, is that God's will for you, for me? That's the question that we need to ask ourselves. That's the question that we need to ask ourselves when we encounter everything in our life. We are the disciples of Yeshua, our Lord, and we, we don't necessarily look for an easy life or honor or money. We are looking for the Lord's will in our life, and sometimes it's hard. I think to myself, the, the flesh really, really wants lots of money and not to do anything. But the question is, is this God's will for me? And I want us to open and talk about it. Like many other things in our life, we need to look back. What was God's plan for us? Even when they came to Yeshua, we spoke about it uh, when we spoke about marriage. They came to him and asked, is it possible to send your wife away for anything, to divorce your wife for anything? And Yeshua said, wait, what was written in the beginning? He pointed them back to the book of Genesis and it says that God created them male and female and he brought them to be one flesh. We need to go back and understand what the plan of God was. When we understand the plan of God, we will be able to answer ourselves in a more clear way. So let's open in the book of Genesis, chapter 2. You know, if you take the book of Genesis and you take it, take it out of the scriptures, it feels like a tower falling off, falling apart. It's stones built upon each other. 
We need to understand the basis, the base of the base of the world we live in. So Genesis chapter two, chapter two speaks after the about after the creation, about the time between <coughs> between uh, the Shabbat that God rested and the time that God that Adam and Eve fell in sin. This is the time that Adam and Eve live in the Garden of Eden, in the perfect place, in the perfect plan of God. So, chapter 2, verse 15. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden and to tend and keep it. It's a very weird verse. <laughs> I have to say, I don't know what there is to do or to work in a perfect Garden of Eden. Sincerely speaking, what, what was the purpose of that? God created everything, all the trees are perfect, all the animals are perfect, everything is good. Why did God put Adam there to work? Not only to work, also to keep. To keep it. Keep it from who? I don't know. I have a theory. I think God prepared Adam or created Adam and prepared him because he had a plan. He knew he was going to fall. But what was there to do in the Garden of Eden? I think it's always possible to work. You can always work. There is always something to do. There is always more you can do. And especially when we serve the Lord that has no limit. Our work has to have no, uh, no connection to fruit or to any other thing that we have around us. In other words, we, the men, were created to work. Is there anyone who thinks otherwise that a man shouldn't work? <laughs> Come to me later, I'll talk to you. I'll explain you very well why, why you're wrong. But the human person is someone who needs to work, is a creature who needs to work. Work should be according to God's plan, not, not related to how much money I have in the bank account or to a culture that I lived in or to what other people think. Work not necessarily also only for bringing food home, but work that has a benefit, work that has value. It's not only because I have or don't have money. And it's also part of serving. We have to be in service. People that are active, people that do things, that, that uh, multiply the sack that the Lord gave us. Remember that parable? One of them said, I'll put my sack in the ground. And Yeshua calls him an evil and lazy servant. But my Lord has everything. Why should I do more? Because this is submission to what God says. Work service is submitting to what God says. And this is the true heart. Moreover, men, husbands, also have responsibility, responsibility over their families. We'll speak about it soon. But we do need to be active people. The sickness of our generation, especially amongst the young people, is boredom. I'm bored. I don't have anything to do. Right? I'm a father to five children, soon six with God's help. We hear it a lot. Mommy, I'm bored. Good, good, great. I have something for you to do. <laughs> That's the correct answer to tell them. Boredom leads us to bad things. 
being inactive brings us to bad things. I want to speak about two people who were rich in the scriptures and still were active. Even though they didn't need to be active, they could sit uh, silently, quietly, and could do nothing, but they still chose to do it. So the first one, of course, is Abraham in Genesis chapter 18. Abraham was a very rich person. He had slaves and cattle and he didn't lack anything. And still, let's see what Abraham does at 99 years of age. I don't think there's anyone 99 years old here, even though he lived for 175 years, so that's all rational. But, but let's read Genesis chapter 18. From verse 1 through 8. Then the Lord appeared to him by the turban trees of Mamre, and he was sitting in the door in the heat of the day. So he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing by him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the ground and said, My Lord, if I have now found favor in your sight, do not pass on by your servant. Please let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will bring a morsel of bread and you may refresh your hearts. After that, you may pass in as much as you have come to your servant. They said, do as you have said. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah and said quickly, make ready three measures of fine meal, knead it and make cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd, took a tender and good calf, gave it to the young man, and he and hastened to prepare it. So he took the butter and milk and the calf which he had prepared and set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree as they ate. Abraham is 99 years old, a very rich person. He didn't need to work one more day in his life. What did he do? He sat outside his tent and looked. He was looking for something. Bringing uh, guests into his house. Runs to those three people. Come. He tells them, take a piece of bread and then continue. When we, in our culture, it's, it's the other way around. I'll explain why. Because Abraham said, <laughs> come and eat just one piece of bread, but he brought them cakes and bread and uh, meat and butter. And that's what we need to learn from as well. How should we bring guests into our house? But that's a different thing. He didn't just... <laughs> he didn't just say, I'll bring you something little and say, oh, my flower just finished, I'll give you two, take these two olives here. No, he came generously. He didn't owe them anything. He didn't have to do anything, but he wanted to do it. A 99-year-old man ran to the cattle and took the calf and prepared, and then, then he standed and waited like a waiter. Abraham, 99 years old, uh, very rich person. I think in our days, he could be called a billionaire. And he was standing there and serving them. Why? I think it's because he got used to doing good. Doing good has no age has no limit. Doing God, good in God's fear continues all throughout our lives. It might change in how we do it. When we are young people, we can do more physical things, and when we're older, we can do other things. But doing good deeds in the fear of the Lord is something that continues all our life. 
And another thing, we need to learn another thing here. You promised something, you can do much more than that. Try not to do less than what you promised. And I also say to myself, do more for the benefit of other people. Give more. What, what will happen? Bless people. The worst thing that could happen is that you'll receive more blessing from God. The second person that I want to talk about is Job. Let's open in Job chapter 1. You know, Job, in his times, he was the richest. The richest in all the, uh, in all the world back then, like Elon Musk of our day, something that, something like that. Let's read from verse 1 through 5. Job 1, verses 1 through 5. There was a man in the land of Uts, which was named Job. And that man was blameless and upright, and one who feared God and shunned evil. And seven sons and three daughters were born to him. Also his possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yokes of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and very large household, so that this man was the greatest of all people of the East. And his sons would go and feast in their houses, each on his appointed day, and would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. So it was, when the days of fasting had run their course, that Job would stand and sanctify them, and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons and my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did regularly. Job was a very rich person, that's what we see, and in the first four verses it seems as though it was a perfect world, utopia. Also, all of his children are good friends, they don't fight, they call their sisters, and they celebrate together, and they do many things together. It seems as though Job can get up at 12 o'clock, go say some things to do, and then go and sit down at the pool and live that weird dream that we talked about before. Instead of that, Job rises up in the morning and sacrifices God, sacrifices to God. He understands his role as a father in his home. He wants to be the priest of his house for his children, saying, maybe my children by mistake cursed God. In Hebrew, it says maybe they blessed God because, because in Hebrew, in the Bible, you won't see a sentence saying, uh, cursing God. It, they say, they write blessing God, but you understand here that uh, he means cursing God. So they say, maybe they cursed God, maybe they sinned. I want to be there for them. I want to find, I want to pray to God for them. That's also a very important thing for us to remember. Even if we reached a certain high place, we still need to remember the basic things of family, of praying for each other. You know that one of the things that are important, especially for 
Older people is to be people of prayer. I got to know many people. I can, I can give uh, Karen, my wife, my wife, her grandmother died when she was 102 years old and for some tens of years before that she couldn't leave the house but every time every time we came to visit her at her home she was sitting there with her bible open and she said i prayed for you and i prayed for that person and i prayed for for all these other people and she she was she was a very old person that went through both world wars and everything she always used to say was how good is Yeshua that's what she had on her lips to say she was a true person of prayer and we saw it on the blessing on her family that continued forward to the next generations and with also, also with her grandchildren so I want to encourage you especially the older people take time to pray it's not less important than to do physical things. You have a role and a very important role for your families, for your congregation, for our nation. You have this important role that's less physical but has a very deep meaning. In contrast to that, I want to bring a case that we all know about King David. You remember when he, when everything that happened with Bathsheba happened? When God left him, when God gave him freedom from all uh, enemies around. I'm not coming to... Uh, I don't know what I would do at that situation, but when all the problems are gone, the wrong things start happening. We need to learn and get to be those people who do beneficial things, to work, to do something beneficial. It has a meaning. It has an even greater meaning for us as men, as the heads of the family. We have the obligation to take care of our families. We need to take, we need to care for our wives and children in the most basic way the most basic way of a person is to be is to take care of his family before you run to do any other service first of all take care and care for your home you know there were people even in the New Testament time that were lazy and it might, might sound weird why is it so important in the eyes of God it's only work it's only money I mean money is not so important in our lives but caring for your family is one of the most important things in the eyes of God and I want us to open in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 <coughs> from verse 10 verses 10 through 13 he speaks here about people from within the congregation from the congregation of the Thessalonians who did not 
obey the instructions or the or what Paul left for them. One of the most important things is bringing food at home, like working and bringing food home. Second Thessalonians 3, 10 to 13. For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. For we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busy bodies. Now those who are such, we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. But as for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. Let's continue, verses 14 and 14. And if anyone does not obey our words in this epistle, note that person, do not keep company with him that he may be ashamed, yet do not count him as an enemy, but uh, admonish him as a brother. Here, in this last passage of the epistle to the Thessalonians, speaks about work and uh, uh, bring food home. He starts with this and he says, we gave you the example. He and the people that were with him, even though it was okay for them to receive money from the congregation, they didn't take anything from the congregation. Paul used to build tents. He was a tent maker and he sat and worked and he earned his own bread and continued to share the gospel while working. And he said, he says, there are some people in the congregation here that do not work and that are lazy, doing, yeah, spending their time on nothing, basically. I think that also today, there are many people who waste their time on uh, nonsense and nonsense never brings good outcomes and not only I say but the word of God says here and if anyone sees that he has too much nonsense in, your, in their life go work go work and if you if you work and you still have free time and you deal with nonsense go volunteer there is enough things to do in the congregation I can turn you to the right people so that you'll find what, something to do and you won't be bored. It's, a, it's an important principle not to waste your time and waste your days on nonsense. And even more, Paul the Apostle writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 5, it's a hard saying, a harsh saying, what he says here. He speaks in this chapter about older people, about widows and about older people. A whole chapter. He speaks about he distinguishes older widows who have some record behind them, older women who did good deeds throughout their life, fearing God. And he says they are worthy of honor. And he even warns the young people and tells them, first of all, you should take care of your household. And he says a very harsh statement here that we need to pay attention to. Verse 
But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. And let's read also verse 4. But if any widow has a children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show pity at home and to repay their parents, for this is good and acceptable before God. All the young people, take care of your parents first of all. Honor your parents. Check if your parents need anything. You will be the first ones to help them. Not to turn them away from here to there and from there to here. Your parents are the most important people to a young person. Of course, if you're married, it's your wife or your husband. But we are obligated to honor our parents also with money. If my parents need help, I need to be the first one to support them. Paul the Apostle says, writes, whoever does not take care of his home has denied the faith. It's a very, very, very harsh statement. Has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. And this is a rebuke for all of us. I want to warn all of us to check our own household, first of all. First of all, if our parents or one of the older people in our family who needs help, we need to be the ones to take care of them and support them and help them. <coughs> and here, as, as we spoke before, the widows or the older women, uh, they continually pray day and night. I think it's such a beautiful thing. It's like a circle that's being built all the time. God built it or created it in such a wise way. Another lie of the world today is that the world, belo the world belongs to the young people. The young people lead the world, they go forward, they deserve everything. And the older people, just, just let them not disturb us. In, a, in an old age home, no one needs to see them, no one needs to talk about them. But the Word of God speaks the opposite way. The older people, we need to give them more honor. We need to honor the older people. We need to hear their counsels. We don't have to receive 100% of what they say, but we need, but God speaks about the older people. They went through a thing or two in their lives, and we need to listen, open our ears to what the older people say and Older people, you have a role in prayer day and night. And it's some sort of a circle here. And then the young people learn from them and turn to be older. And the younger people who under them listen to them, give them honor. And it's something that's, that gets built in a, in a nice way. I want to finish with something. Sometimes, like everything in life, it can take a big, a, something too big in our life. On one hand, we can have this tendency not to work or to deal with nonsense. But on the other hand, you can be a workaholic. You can be addicted to work. You have to work from before the sun rises up to after it goes down. That's the only thing that you know to talk about. I made so much money and I was good at my work and, and I work all the time, all my life. And I have nothing, I have no time for anything else. 
Of course, that's not the purpose. Like in everything, the devil tries to take things to extremities, to extremes, sorry, uh, to here or to there, as long as it's not in the, as long as it's not in God's truth. Our work needs to be according to the fear of God and not because we make the work holy, a holy thing in our life. We know that God created the world in six days and on the seventh day he rested. We see that he first of all worked. By the way, for me it was, it was new. The commandment of resting on Shabbat starts with six days of work. Work six days and then rest on your seventh day on Shabbat. It's not like I rested all week and then I rested on Shabbat. No. You need to use your time. Work on the sixth on six work six days, be beneficial, and then on the seventh day rest. I personally never worked on Shabbat and I don't want to work on Shabbat. There are those who do work on Shabbat. I don't judge them, but I did take this importance of Resting. It's also important to rest. If we work too much and do too much things, we might be uh, we might break down, and then we didn't achieve anything. It's good to take this time to rest. We also know that Yeshua, after long days, there were there was much more and more and more to do. There was always something to do, but he went to the hills and he prayed and he took time alone with the Father. Through that time he uh, renewed his strength and continued with his service. So with this I want to conclude and I want to encourage all of us to be beneficial not to waste our time. The older people, some of the uh, tips that I received from older people is that life passes very quickly. Life passes quickly. Don't waste them. Don't waste it. Now that we have time as young people, I want to encourage you to fill your days with good things with work, with service, and with caring, first of all, for our family. Men with families, for our own families. Young people, for your parents. And we need to honor the older people. Older people, you have a role, a very important one, in prayer and in guidance of the young people. And we all need to remember that we need to be changed. Everything that we receive from the world, from people around us, could be a lie. And we need to be careful. And to think, what does the Word of God say about this? And this is the truth that we need to change ourselves. Amen. 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 So let's stand up. Let's invite the worship team. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord shine his face towards you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face to you and give you peace. May the grace of Yeshua our Lord and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all of us. Oh, shit.
להיות מאה אחוז עבורך, אדון. לרוץ עליך, אדון, עם כל הכוח שלנו, כל הזמן, כל, ה... כל מה שיש לנו, לחיות עבורך, אדון. הללויה, בשם ישוע. אמן. שיהיה שבוע טוב ושבת שלום. <אז>